your uh, Sunday afternoon off to, to join us. I'm Bill Arthur, the director of the Art Center. Um, first thing before I forget, just a, a piece of housekeeping. Um, it's a bit of information that we have not made public yet, but we will be doing so next week. And that is that this exhibition, uh, Faces of Change, is going to be extended through December 18th. So, uh, <laughs> Bill, and I would like to uh, do a ditto on your thank you to Gerald and to David Norland for the invite. And it's great to get back together with Gerald after 15 years when I had the opportunity that was such an honor to present to a psychology class fresh out of prison. Uh, <clears throat> soon after <clears throat> the greatest day of my life, which was January 20th, 2001, the day that former Bill, President Bill Clinton commuted the remaining 15 years I had left on my 27 year sentence after I served 10 years in federal prison so that I could miraculously be here and share this awesome day with you. Um, I also, uh, so when that day happened, not too long after that, I had the honor to come home to this unbelievably warm and welcoming community that I hated to leave, but I had to go to Wichita. But uh, so it's really a great honor to come back here today and see so many uh, friendly faces here that I know from the past. Uh, and a couple of those I'm going to point out, I just have to uh, give some special recognition to people that were unbelievable support in my life. And that would begin with uh, someone that's truly his brother's keeper, and many of you probably know he's kind of that way, uh, Father Kerry Neinmeyer. <laughs> and I also have to recognize my sister, Kathy and her awesome husband, Ralph. And 
and Bob Carey and my best friend Neil Zeusis uh, were my support and guidance through many of the messes that I made in my life and I can assure you there were many and they weren't small. Uh, Kathy was there with her love and nurturing support and one of the things that it reminded me of that Kathy did, she did like many family members, she did her time with me. So many family members I felt like, you know, they're captured in the same prison uh, and I felt like it may at times have been more difficult for her than it even was for me inside. So um, I would start off by saying that I remember one time I was in my prison cell and there was a correctional officer that came in and he started looking at my bulletin board and he said, Neymar, what happened to you? He goes, you know, you don't have any half nude pictures of women up here or anything. You've got pictures of a wonderful, loving, supportive family and friends. What happened? And you know, that I've contemplated for a number of years of my life, uh, while I was there 10 years and since. And um, I guess I would just start it off by saying um, that I was a troubled, anxious, compulsive, impulsive kid that just always thrived on attention and immediate gratification because I was one insecure kid. Uh, when I was early in high school, I became a rebellious, defiant kid that just identified with every part of that, if you can imagine. And I had quite a conflict going on with my loving, caring, and somewhat authoritarian father. And I thought I found the perfect answer to all that the first time I got stoned, thanks to a Vietnam vet coming home from Vietnam. The answer was, I'm not going to get pissed anymore, I'm just going to get stoned. The problem with that was, is I couldn't quit getting stoned, and I kept getting stoned, no matter how much over the years up to that, that I thought I would try to manage the getting stoned. It led me all the way, almost daily up, until I went to prison at age 35. I became captured in my own prison that was marijuana, and soon after that, it became selling and growing marijuana and eventually growing, uh, sell, using and selling cocaine. One of the defining points in all of that was when my father passed at the, when I was 22 years old and that was like the reins came off of a wild horse. And from that point on, it was Katie bar the door. Um, so I just give you a real quick encapsulation of how this all came about. The first time I got busted was in 1981 for 100 pounds of marijuana. And I wouldn't be here today if the half a pound of cocaine that was also there didn't get thrown out, but it did. So I pled guilty to a felony. I got a one to three year sentence in the state of Kansas. I had this, I thought, awesome probation officer named Uncle Ed Piper. Ed never had me do a UA. He just said, send in your report speed. I thought, well, this is good. So I soon got a job so I could have a pay stub to turn in. And I turned that pay stub in. And uh, because and soon after I got a kid that was going to college that wanted a job to work on the oil rig for me. So I, I took the money, I gave him the money and I got the pay stub and took that to Uncle Ed and I kept growing marijuana. I thought I really got over. Later on, I found out not so much. Uh, so about a year later, I get this letter in the mail, and I just came home from taking my marijuana crop to Florida and selling it. And a lot of this stuff, folks, I'm not proud of, but it was just part of the reality of my being in the prison I was in. But I came back and brought some cocaine back from Florida that I traded my marijuana for. I got a letter in the mail that said, congratulations, your probation, or it just said your probation has been terminated. So I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, I'm in big trouble. So I can't tell you the amount of drugs I did contemplating all the trouble I was in over that weekend. But anyhow, I called Uncle Ed on Monday and he said, you've successfully completed your probation. <laughs> so then it was on. So over the next five years, I grew marijuana. I went to California, got involved out there. Five years later, I was in Eastern Kansas and uh, got busted down there with the Californians with 1,800 transplants uh, by a sheriff that was an off-duty sheriff that looked over this brand new picket fence on a hundred-year-old chicken coop, thought something was up there, and uh, we ended up getting a, uh, I got a four to ten year sentence out of that, but he didn't really have a warrant to look over the fence, so that kept Pete out doing the same thing he had always done. 
which has run from his problem and stay captured in his prison without knowing any of that. So anyhow, I felt like the doors were closing in. Two and a half years later, they surely were uh, when I got busted the third time on August 15th of 1989. And my state attorney that told me the last time he saw me was, Pete, you need to find, this is a bad career choice. You need to find a different career because the next time you get in one of these situations, they're gonna cut you know what off and you're gonna be in big trouble. And I understood then what, I, what he was talking about because I had a 24 and a half year sentence I was looking at without any possibility of parole. So thanks to my brother being a priest and coming from a great family, the judge let me have BOR on my own recognizance. And at that particular time, I was kind of looking at one of the worst <coughs> choices I had at that time, which was either going to prison for most, if not all the rest of my life, or becoming a fugitive. I had a lot of other activities going on. It was a horrible decision either way. And I, I took off. I was on the run for a year and a half before I was rescued, thankfully, in Miami, Florida on February 8th of 1990, extradited to Kansas, and uh, ultimately ended up at a county jail, Frank, at, uh, Jackson County Jail in Holton, Kansas, where, of course, the first guy I run into is another guy that I get it, bro. We got to get out of here. This is our last chance. So we started plotting to uh, break out of that county jail, which thankfully a uh, federal inmate was there and he decided he wanted some time off his sentence. So he told them about that. And the next thing I know, I'm in the United States Penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas, in solitary confinement, knowing I finally couldn't run anymore from Peter Nyberg. So it was at that time Although it was a little late and I was a little oblivious to the obvious, I decided that it was time for change. And guess what? It was never too late for change, thankfully. So I remember the first night I had <clears throat> when I got moved out of solitary to a D cell block where there were about 160, or 285 Mariel Cubans living below and that was called, they called it Little Cuba, right? Because it was their place. <laughs> And we understood that. Uh, but anyhow, the first night I was there, I woke up in the middle of the night and the correctional officers were taking the guy in the cell next to me down. He'd managed to tear his sheet in half and hang himself in the cell next to me. And I thought, oh my God, this is going to be a journey. And it was. But thank God at that time, I decided somehow, some way, the only way I could survive this journey was somehow I had to stay positive and somehow turn this into a positive experience, although I never had any idea that I would be here today. I can assure you of that. Um, <clears throat> one of the greatest things that happened to me <clears throat> that both contributed to my commutation and my change in prison was getting involved with, uh, was in the middle of all this dark blight, I got a, a one-page letter from an organization that had just started, just been founded called Families Against Mandatory Minimums. And I hooked up with that organization. And when I got to FCI Inglewood, where I did most of my time, medium security uh, prison in Littleton, Colorado, I uh, got with other inmates. We founded a chapter. The warden said, look, Neymar, you're not going to form a families against mandatory minimums in my prison. <laughs> okay. You know, I'm not making that statement. Okay. But anyhow, what happened was, is that we formed that and out of that grew a prison youth counseling program called Jericho Road, Jericho Road, that ended up being a transformative program in my life uh, then, and that still continues uh, to this day. Uh, that, that program changed the culture of the institution. It gave the inmates there an opportunity to, if they did this, they got to work with other people and it comes down to this, you know, I really finally found the direction, purpose, meaning, and direction I had never found in my life in all the years that I had been doing drugs and that whole related lifestyle. I got this on a Facebook post this morning from our neighbor and uh, my cousin, Linda, I'm glad to see you. It's really an honor to see you here today, but you, you know Gloria Johnson like our family does. And Gloria sent me this post this morning that said, I thought it was too applicable, I had to put it in here. When one discovers what their purpose in life is, our own life experiences of the past begin to make sense. 
You just can't beat that feeling you receive knowing you helped another human being. What I learned from my friend Neil was that you can only have what you give to others. So the other side of this positive prison experience that I began having was I watched the removal of Pell Grants in federal prison. When I first went there, there were all these guys that were just clamoring over getting to their classes, doing their homework, and they had awesome relationships with their teachers, but they removed Pell Grants. As many of you know, that was around the time that we had this whole tough on crime movement that brought in the advent of the mandatory minimums and all this. And so they said, you know, correctional officers, kids can't get these, so you sh these inmates and prisoners surely shouldn't give them, get them as well. I mean, what we, what we always do with criminal justice are short-sighted approaches. And really, if you invested the $5,000 to educate every prisoner that was in there for four or five years, you wouldn't be spending the 50, 25 to 35 to whatever thousand dollars a year. You, you would have them to ensure their success and actually help them become law-abiding, productive, tax-paying citizens. So that was the other part of it. But um, the thing I also want to talk about a little bit is that what was in there, you know, anytime we had the positive impact those, those teachers had, but the prison volunteers that came in, and I want to thank every one of you in attendance today because I cannot tell you how much sense of community, belonging, and validation that you gave us all and what that did <clears throat> for relieving our shame and understanding that we were not damaged property, we were good people that made bad mistakes, made some bad choices. So um, that, so my spiritual journey, you know, began in Leavenworth because I thought, you know, <clears throat> I started exploring a lot of things. I was raised Catholic, and and I guess that just never identified with me the way that it did with other members of my family, which I just could not respect or honor more or anybody's faith from whatever that direction is. But for me, my spiritual journey uh, led me to Buddhism, to Buddhism, um, which ultimately helped me learn acceptance and come to terms with my situation in prison. We had a really cool, we had some volunteers that came down from Boulder and we had what we call a meditation or Sangha group that met every Thursday night. And I validated, they validated with me the same way my Christian brothers and other brothers and si brothers from other faiths uh, face congregated in what was the most religious denominations under one roof in Colorado. Because the federal prison was an equal opportunity employer, not just in the United States, but from around the world. So, um, what I learned from Buddhism was that I was the, create, the sole creator of my own suffering and basically was just a stimulus response machine and that's what I had been for much of my life and that really didn't serve me very well in that kind of a volatile, often volatile situation. What I began to do was focus on the inside and live my, side, live my life inside of the fence. As I often said, you know, we can either live our life or do our time. I chose to live my life inside the fence and not focus on the things I couldn't do or couldn't have on the outside. So that was part of it. I just seeing this awesome art exhibition with these inmates, I mean, just, just talking about it just gives me chills. Uh, every salutation, every commentary I seen on the bottom of those uh, portraits I, I related with. So it's a, uh, I think Bill North and I were talking just about how confined that environment is. So just imagine how vulnerable everyone is in there and how well everybody knows everybody. So of course, everyone in there gets a handle. Now my handle was the mayor. Because I, I, I actually, and everybody in there also finds their own way to survive that difficult situation. Now, instead of joining a gang or finding a sense of identity or belonging in that, I use my people skills and my great values that I was raised with to communicate with the staff and other people. And my people skills, if you were, kind of to survive that situation. So I, I can tell you something else I learned from all that, that I would rather be just a regular citizen than have the prestigious honor of being the mayor of Inglewood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, but I can tell you that the change process for me didn't happen overnight. When I went to prison, I was one angry person. I couldn't believe that I got 25 years for this sentence and that I was so angry at that that I never had the ability to take a look at what got me there. But once I did, and I began seeing that I, the role I played in experiencing what I was experiencing, then that really helped me come to terms with a lot of things in my life. And one of the things I, one of the people that I learned it from was this fascinating guy I will never forget as long as I live named Mike. Mike was both crazy and brilliant. Mike said, you know, I've got this really bright side of me that I know how to change people, Pete, and I, and I can teach you and you're an idiot if you don't listen, okay? And that's the way he talked. Mike was somebody that was responsible for the most, one of the most nefarious bank robberies in Northern California. And I later heard that Mike had schizophrenia, which I thought might help explain his insight, brilliance, and dark side. So what I learned from him was that change requires a temporary surrender of security. And that came with me having the courage and vulnerability to begin taking accountability for what I have done with my life. And I've seen that same central theme in most all the inmates that are on the walls here today. Uh, I became empowered whenever I quit blaming everything and everybody for everything that I happened in my life and started using the Buddhist approach that I was the sole creator of my way to prison, which I worked really hard at. So um, I also learned that change does not normally come about until the thought of continuing the way we are actually looks worse than the thought of facing the fear of the unknown that requires the temporary surrender of security. Sadly for me, that had to come about when I was at in solitary confinement in Lebanon. So it also requires having the courage to be vulnerable and embracing vulnerability. You've seen that in every one of these individuals on the walls here today. And I've learned that being vulnerable is one of the number one keys to growth. If we don't learn, grow, and change, we aren't really living. That was something that Gail Sheedy said. So maybe the greatest virtue of all I learned in prison was humility. My number was 04083-031. I knew I wouldn't have to think of it. <laughs> okay, it's never far away. Uh, but I also learned that humility and ego are inversely proportionate. And just think about that and how true that is. And you know, my friend Mike Parsons, that was him. That's who I first gained that from because as brilliant as he was, he had to constantly be reinforced that he was. Um, so much of what I learned in prison, in my, in my inward journey in prison, I readily apply to my counseling and therapy today at the Caring Center of Wichita. Uh, today, I'm beyond blessed to have a, a uh, mental health and substance abuse practice. It's actually a private practice with a substance abuse component that I think we're one of the only standalone facilities uh, in Wichita that has that. But um, what we do is serve the co-occurring population. And um, I got to tell you that I have the most interesting, fascinating, chaotic, and exciting life I could ever imagine. And every day I wake up, and right now it just puts goosebumps on me to actually believe this is a life that I'm blessed to live. Uh, I used to tell myself in prison that, you know, most everyone on the outside, they have their own prison too, you know? And the more that I've done therapy for the last four or five years, the more true that I found that to be. And I just say this, just imagine how crazy, and, and I really am crazy, and that's why I love psychology, because I've always wondered why I was, okay? <laughs> and that is the study of human behavior. But, you know, I'm sitting here the other day talking with, a, working with a couple in marriage and family counseling and, and therapy, and I'm telling this doctor and his wife that's an attorney, I'm giving them the analogy that they're in prison and that we have to just learn what we have control over and accept our limitations. 
And it worked for him. You know? So, you know, it, it really is true with people from all walks of life. So one of the other things that I learned uh, was I had this st uh, statement from placard from Chuck Swindle. I don't know if any of you have ever seen it, but it's attitudes. And this lady's nodding that she has. It's a powerful portrait uh, and just communication about that life's about 10% what happens and 90% what happens to you. And it's more important, it goes than everything you can imagine, the most important valuable commodity that we all have in life is our attitude. <clears throat> so now I'm gonna switch in the last part of this uh, presentation for, to kind of talk to you about something I learned about myself and many of the patients I work with. And that is I primarily have patients who deal with the disease of addiction. And I call my, the folks I see patients because I want them and everyone else that I ever come in contact with to understand that addiction is a medical condition. And I would much rather call it a substance use disorder, which is now classified under our Diagnostics and Statistical Manual, our new DSM-5, because of the horrible stigmatization that people have with addiction, which is just giving something that's the most complex disease maybe known to man right now, a very simple label. And that's the last thing that it is. So one of the things I do is really teach my patients about, you know, what, about how it's just the same thing as depression or anxiety or the ADHD that I have, which is why I got notes in front of me today. Because my thing is I'd rather just get up and talk, but I know we'll just go all over the place. So I can just mark my symptoms. My brother's laughing for some reason. But, <laughs> But anyhow, I go through and show them, look, these are the symptoms that we have with this condition. These are the symptoms that we have with the use disorder that is manifested by it, the way it's impairing functioning in major areas of our life. And this psychoeducation, if you will, really does help them come. People begin to understand and, uh, they're, and, and why they're doing what they're doing and understand the complexity of who they are. Not to mention the stress and the life that they've lived and all the inherent stressors with all of that. So, you know, it's amazing that I never saw the myriad of ways that marijuana was impacting my life. You know, I call that again being oblivious to the obvious, <laughs> okay? But, um, you know, that's the way it is in addiction. You don't know what you're doing when, when you're doing it. You're just really caught up in it. And, you know, I never even realized I was dependent on marijuana. And today I've got this new research and I went to Harvard to the medical school presentation last year and got this unbelievable research on, you just would not believe all the withdrawal symptoms are with marijuana, all the different areas of the brain that functions. There was a person in our church this morning that talked about uh, he moved out of Colorado and he just shared how the whole free drug thing and everything out there he thought was really having a negative impact out there. So I understand that for some people, marijuana, just like alcohol and other drugs is not addictive. But for me and many others, marijuana is harmful, it's addictive, and there are withdrawal symptoms. So my ADD jumped off there and I just had to go off script a little and let everybody know the true facts about that. Um, but you know, they called me 12 by 12. That meant I smoked 12 joints by 12 noon, but Pete didn't know he had a problem. Didn't know I was addicted until I got out of prison. And um, so this was something that was a really powerful moment in my life. <clears throat> I was in prison and throughout my time there, you know, four or five times in the first four or five years I was there, somebody had some weed and of course, you know, and not every time because I wasn't, I was trying to get away from that and it just <clears throat> wasn't that appealing to me anymore. But, but there was this time, the very last time I've ever smoked marijuana or will ever smoke marijuana, um, in federal prison, we were, we had somehow inmates had filed a lawsuit, a class action lawsuit against the institution for housing us <clears throat> in a place where there was asbestos. So they said, okay, so individually, you're each going to go down and live in this gymnasium for about six to eight months at a time. That was no fun. So while I was down there, somebody had some weed, I smoked it and I got stoned. 
And as I was laying there in my bunk bed, <clears throat> I just was overcome with shame when I thought about how this kid that came from a great family in Northwestern Kansas could screw up their life so bad that I was doing 30 years in federal prison because I still had that four to 10 year sentence from the state that was hanging on to the end of my federal sentence. And in that moment, I decided that it wasn't even about the sentence I was serving. The reason I was there was simply because I couldn't quit using that substance that had me in that state of mind that I was not enjoying. And I actually had a bad trip on marijuana. The same way I had a bad trip on LSD the last time I did it, the first time I was looking at prison after I got busted then. So here I go. I go from, I'm, I have this shame and guilt and I just blocked it out all the way to where I think I was about three or four years out of prison. I was working for the Daily Reporting Center in Wichita <clears throat> and Families Against Mandatory Minimums, bless their heart, they, they hired me after I got out of prison and I couldn't get the Daily Reporting Center to send me there, but FAM and bless her heart, Julie Stewart, sent me to Birmingham, Alabama, where I attended a conference on the neuroscience of addiction. The purpose of the conference was to have people understand that addiction was a medical, a, a public health problem, a public safety problem secondarily to it being a public health problem. So there was a presenter there named Dr. Merrill Norton that did a presentation called Methamphetamine, the Hijacking of the Human Brain. And I was mesmerized. And he said you could supplant alcohol, cocaine, marijuana, any substance that you use too much, too often, and it changes the brain until it becomes normal with the substance present, and in many substances, the body too. Okay, so I came away from that conference and I understood, I finally started letting go of the shame and understood that it wasn't near as much about what happened, what was wrong with me as what happened to me in terms of the disruption of the critical brain structures that control judgment, decision making, and behavior that we know as a disease of addiction. And I can't tell you how far that's went toward me helping relieve some of the guilt and shame many of my patients experience today. I have to say that this science and knowledge matches my experience perfectly, and I collaboratively learn in almost every session that I do, if not every session I do with my patients, because they just keep teaching me about this disease and I keep teaching them and giving them what I knew, no, and I kind of start watching that shame and guilt and that hope start coming out and rising out of that shame and guilt. So, um, you know, I would say that the main difference between this highly misunderstood disease of addiction is the manifestation that it's manifested through people's choices and behaviors rather than physical symptoms that are manifested through other traditional diseases like, you know, whether it's heart disease, lung disease, or maybe diabetes. But I have put together presentations on the similarities about it. But the lack of this understanding creates the stigmatization that goes along with the disease of addiction. So I also want to say that patients have got mutual responsibility in doing what, you know, in treating their disease the most effective way possible and anyone that's in recovery should know that they are also, like myself, we are the faces and voices of recovery and change in this regard. Now I'm going to switch a little bit to the policy end, uh, toward the end of my speech here. And I want to say that the most rewarding and challenging job I had <clears throat> was working for the Sedgwick County uh, Drug Court when it the first implemented. A uh, highly stressful job working for ComCare, the Community Mental Health Center, but the rewards of it were that I got to work with the judiciary, the district attorney's offices, and probation officers, as well as my three counselors, as we collaboratively, I call it collaborative justice, that we worked on in a therapeutic alliance as we would staff patients every week, and I called them patients there too, and I definitely would never call them offenders. 
And that's one of the things that's, you know, with the criminal justice system, they do their notes and it's always this offender, that and that offender. You know, I mean, that is so damaging. And so we're trying to get that across to them. But anyhow, to get more back, back to the point here, we, we collaboratively decided what we felt would most effectively uh, create changing behavior. And that was usually found in support rather than detention. I remember when Judge Kisner would say to me, so Mr. Therapist, what do you think is the most effective therapeutic uh, action that we should take here? And I would say, well, Judge, in this case, I think a weekend in jail looks like it would be appropriate. <laughs> I also remember the judge asking me in open court one time, <clears throat> there was a patient I had that had about, she had every kind of mental health condition and never had treatment for that you could imagine. She was hooked on meth. She had about three months in recovery. She had friends that called her from Dodge City. They came up, she let them in their house and she used. And he said, Mr. Neinmeier, I wanna ask you, and he said that she was responsible for her using and she could have turned him away at the door. And I said, your honor, with all due respect, I have to say that that wasn't when the relapse occurred. It occurred when she made the phone call because once they were on the way there and they came to the door, the critical brain structures that disrupt this, okay, that's an involuntary action. There was no way when you combine the biological and the psychological with that, that she was ever gonna say no. And my boss chastised me for that after the court was over but she would never understand the disease of addiction as I have, because I know it, because I lived it. So I tell you, one of the greatest honors that I had on top of this was I became really close friends with Maggie McIntyre. She was a district attorney for the, she, for, she was the DA representative for the drug court. And she said, you know, Pete, I love this so much more because I actually get to help change people's lives. And I don't think prison does a very good job of that. So one day she comes over with Mandy Schaefer, her little assistant, young assistant, and I don't mean this in a drug, but you'll see where the story goes, okay? So I'm just coming out of jail where I just interviewed another patient up in jail and told them I've been here and you know, we just connected and I just was again on cloud nine, like, oh my God, that was fantastic. And here comes Maggie and Mandy running over there and Pete, guess what? Mike Jennings, and Mike Jennings, by the way, was the assistant DA underneath Nola Folston, and he always went to Topeka to testify against anything I was testifying for in terms of drug treatment alternatives to prison, okay? And Mike was a Berth Berkeley graduate, Cal Berkeley. You know, I'm like, this guy's bright. He knows better. Sure enough, Mike did. She said, Mike Jennings is, wants me to ask you to present a five-part series on the neuroscience of addiction to the DA's office. And I about, I just about fell over. I go, that's gonna be like the greatest honor of my life, my professional life. Mandy's all like, God, you need to get a life, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, it just doesn't get any bigger and better than this. And I did that, and what an honor it was. <clears throat> and I'll never forget what a DA said to me. She said, she came to everyone. She goes, Pete, this makes sense. I just thought they were stupid. Cause they, how could they do it? They do it and get back out and use and use. And, I, and she said, now I understand what's going on. So anyhow, in the end, you know, I, I started it off with telling them that, I, I hate to say this, but a lot of what I'm going to talk about and teach, I learned in prison, okay? And then in the end, I said, you know, I, I guess this is quite a full circle for me because some years ago, I was third on your most wanted list. So, uh, that, that, was, <laughs> that was when I was a fugitive. But uh, as Pam, Neil's wife, told me one time, and it was, it, I never have owned guns or been violent, and she said, Pete, if you and our other friend are, are first and third on the most wanted list in the state, we feel pretty safe. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyhow, now, um, the, then I'm gonna take us into this video, but I wanna tell the story, I think it's a great story, about another great relationship I formed. When I was at the Day Reporting Center, there was a doctor, Dr. Nancy Ensko, came through on a walkthrough, and she was there to actually kind of doing background on it, but Nancy was the youngest female warden of a maximum security prison 
in the United States of America that she took over at the age of 25. And her and I started talking and we hit it off like crazy and pretty soon I've got Nancy off from her tour group and blah, blah, blah. And she said, here my card, give me a call. First time I talked to Nancy, we talked for an hour <coughs> and 25 minutes and we're dear friends today. And Nancy <clears throat> said she was a warden for 11 years but she had to quit because she could no longer stand to see the prisons treated, the inmates treated and the prison treated as a default mental health institution. So she formed Criminal Justice Solutions, and one of the things she did was prison and jail studies. So her and I eventually got together to present to the Sedgwick County Commissioners about, they were trying to do, they were going to expand or build onto the Sedgwick County Jail, and we knew where that was going. So I said, you know, Dr. Insko and I come from diverging but converging paths, if you know what I mean, the warden and the inmate are both here today to talk to you about, I talked to them about addiction as a disease and how this was an effective way because I said, you know, when people go to prison and they have diabetes and addiction, when they get out, do they just have diabetes? Did the addiction go away? The truth of the matter is you can only treat the symptoms of this condition in the environment ultimately where the symptoms occur. Now, Nancy's take on this was, that these are, the configuration of jails are completely wrong. We need to get rid of the bricks and mortar and we need to make them a therapeutic community where the walls are this high, everybody's open and visible, that's the safety, that's the way we do the safety aspect of it. It's much safer and actually what the inmates are gonna be learning is about things about addiction that are gonna help them understand that they are just as susceptible or more susceptible than the day they went in. So anyhow, we really had a great, I think, collaboratively presentation. Uh, and ultimately, I don't know how it all happened, but they never did build that addition to the Sedgwick County Jail. My greatest fear is, is dying due to my addiction. Not being able to live out my purpose that God really you know, intended for me to you know, fulfill. My greatest regret it's picking up the first time and then uh, picking up the first time and continuing to go back. The insanity of it, knowing that the more I use, the sicker I get when I was already sick. So just going back, using more, getting even sicker, and just continuing the addiction. Carl Leonard. Sheriff, Chesterfield County, Virginia. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. We've been arresting people for heroin use for decades, and it's not made a difference. And I'm just tired of it. I'm tired of seeing these people come in. They get no treatment. They, they come sober, and they get released, and they go right back to using the drug. I want to stop the deaths. And to do that, we've got to break the addiction. I've been in jail over. Four the time since I was 13, all due to heroin addiction. I wouldn't went to jail if it wasn't for the disease. The disease is sitting lie to me and tell me that everything I'm doing the right thing, I'll be doing things that I really don't want to do. The disease of addiction is a very easy illness to target for a correction industry. They know 97% of the people who use are going to relapse and use again. So. Our system, whether it was deliberately or inadvertently, has been built around the chronicity of addiction. It's a chronic illness. The chronicity plays out in our courtrooms, in our probation offices, in our jails, and in our prisons, and in our communities. So instead of addressing the chronicity part of our illness, our system, our culture addressed the public safety side of it. That's why we have such a large revolving door. History has clearly shown that when you treat addiction as an illness, you actually get a measurable outcome with recovery. HARP is our heroin addiction recovery program. It's uh, an intensive program. It's probably 12 to 15 hours a day that they work at this. It includes peer-to-peer, -peer, which is the biggest component of this. I bring in licensed doctors and psychologists and, and social workers 
addiction specialist, and they can spend hours in here, and, and they have some benefit. But when you can relate to somebody who's in there counseling you because they've been there, they've been an addict, they've been in jail, they've made the recovery, they, they receive that a lot better. And that's one of our biggest things. Once they get released, either by posting bond or bail or serving their time, we allow them to continue to come into the jail every day to continue to participate in these programs. One of the things we've told them is, once you get released, if you ever feel yourself going back to that dope dealer, if you ever feel yourself that urge to shoot up again, come back to jail. Two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. Come here, everyone in this group in HARP has agreed, let us wake them up and they'll be their peer. They'll get them through that tough spot. You know, you know, what do I tell you all? What's the only difference between everybody in these walls and everybody on the other side of the wall? Right turn and left turn. It's one decision in your life brought you here. I made a different decision than you all. Now, we're gonna give you the tools and the skills and the ability to make this decision. So the next time you're confronted with that decision to do that dope, you know, you won't. Uh, you know, I appreciate what you're doing. I believe in you. Uh, if I didn't believe in you, I wouldn't be in here every day, guys. I really wouldn't. So. People are treating us like just throwing us away behind the end of the box. So it's no problem. We just get better at what we're doing. We want to treat our addiction, their disease. I got a year for a violation for dirty urine. When, when I got accepted to a program, the judge rather give me a year in incarceration. I'm only 22 years old and I've been using for a long time. You're going from locked up to the streets and it's overwhelming and we go to what we do best and that's using. My mother, my mother is 53 years old. My father just died in prison. My mother's doing three and a half years and I'm currently doing 18 months. Our job is to show that this is bigger than a public safety issue. This is a health care issue, a health issue. So when we get a politician go out on a limb for us, we have got to make sure we protect that resource and that asset. And in this case, that protection looks like active recovery while you're here and once returning to our community. If you want to see more of this from more politicians across the country, we need to show it. We have got to be faces and voices of recovery, active recovery. We cannot be in the shadows we cannot return to the lives we came from. We gotta be better than that. I've been incarcerated more than four times and this is the most unique um, program I've ever seen. And what makes what's made it so successful in its infancy is the sheriff of Chesterfield County, Carl Leonard, has been so aggressive with this uh, issue. And this I challenge every sheriff's office of every little county from Podunk, Mississippi to New York to everywhere um, to take an aggressive approach as well. These folks are given some privileges. Uh, they're allowed to self-govern, self-rule, and they do a fantastic job of taking care of themselves. They have such great responsibility. Uh, I could trust them to run this entire program by themselves and give them the key to the jail and I wouldn't have to worry about anything. Now, I would never do that and I won't tell them that but they're very trustworthy and, and, and you can just see in them, they're invested. Again, they want this addiction to go away more than anybody. I am motivated by these individuals and they inspire me every day. It's worth investing in them. They are valuable assets to our community and society. Uh, and anybody who thinks otherwise is, is wrong.
that, is that uplifting or what? That, that's what we see about a sense of love, belonging, caring, community. That contributes toward healing, growth, learning, and change, as opposed to the mortar that contributes, the bricks and mortar that I can tell you contribute to criminal beliefs. That's what we see in prison when we, host, we put people in a hostile environment and we treat them like dogs. And I think one of the best um, analogies of this is this poem that was written by this judge, district judge. He said, we want them to be responsible, so we take away their responsibilities. We want them to be part of our community, so we isolate them from our community. We want them to be positive and constructive, so we degrade them and make them useless. We want them to be trustworthy, so we put them where there is no trust. We want them to be nonviolent, so we put them where violence is all around them. We want them to be kind and loving people, so we subject them to hatred and cruelty. We want them to quit being the tough group, so we put them where the tough group and the tough guy is respected. We want them to quit hanging around losers, so we put all the losers in the state under one roof. We want them to quit exploiting us, so we put them where they are exploited. We want them to take control of their lives, solve their problems, and quit being a parasite, so we make them totally dependent on us. That poem was written by District Court Judge Dennis A. Chaw. So I think that's a pretty powerful statement in that regard. Last thing I'm going to say about the therapeutic community is that my vision in a dream world of that would be is that people would come out of there incrementally through graduated sanctions. If they have relapses, which are definitely a part of this disease and recovery, they go back, we keep teaching them skills, and we keep supporting them with social workers. If they have a probation officer, people meet with them in jail. And we could actually start doing something that works because right now we can actually help them learn about the disease of addiction and start treating them in the environment where the symptoms occur. Because right now, 95% of the people that go to prison for drugs and alcohol end up who do not receive treatment and during either during or after their prison stay, end up relapsing, and 70% of them go back to prison. So those statistics tell us that we can't get much worse outcomes than that. Okay, you guys, I don't want to take up your entire presentation because this is supposed to be split up here half and half. I have some policy changes I want to talk about, but maybe some questions will engender that. And if not, you've listened to me very patiently and respectfully for all this time, and I sincerely appreciate that. And every one of you coming today and the love, care, and concern you're showing about this issue and all these individuals on that wall and me up here. So thank you very much. So from talking to David, Bill, and Gerald, uh, one of the, and, and some of the other group members that we uh, kind of coordinated all this with, we thought we would open it up to questions and we can have a dialogue about, about some of your questions. Uh, any comments, questions, any, any thoughts? I, I've got some other stuff I can cover, if not, believe me, but uh, I think there definitely will be. Yes. We need to start treating people as patients and not prisoners that have this disease. That's my, and I guess I'm sounding like a politician, okay? I didn't really give you a defining answer, but no, I really think that's true. Now, I think that marijuana is very addictive for some people. I think it impairs their functioning on major areas of their life. And what I found out from the latest research from Harvard is, is that due to my 20 years of, of marijuana use daily, that I lost on average about nine to 10 IQ points. So that's my excuse, guys. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, we, we're learning all kinds of new stuff about it, just like any other disease, some uh, uh, these substances. Some people can try it, don't have a problem with it. Others have a major problem with it. So I think, you know, what we really should have is treatment on demand 
And we've got, in this country, we've got 22 million people that have substance use disorder. And does anybody venture to guess how many of them are getting treatment? I just make it short, four and a half percent, one million. Okay, so if we had any other disease that was killing more lives than gun violence and auto accidents combined, we would have a public outcry, but yet no one seems to be aware of this disease. So I'm kind of like Michael Botticelli, the new director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. He's a brilliant man in recovery himself, and he said, I really don't believe in throwing another uh, one of these substances, a cocktail into the mix uh, at this particular point in time. I mean, I think people will try marijuana and are going to smoke marijuana and that we need to reduce, you know, the penalties on it and start changing our perspective about it. Uh, I mean, this guy today in Colorado said that it's a mess. He, can, he said the, the rent is crazy. People are all over. I've had several patients that went to Colorado to get involved in the, um, in the uh, growing operations out there and that came back addicted to heroin. And I, I had a, a young lady from Bishop Carroll I was counseling, and she says, Pete, there's no way that marijuana is a gateway drug. And I said, are you telling me, girl, that you would have just done that mushrooms just out of nowhere? You never smoked any pot, and somebody said, here's some mushrooms, try these on. And she said, oh my god, I hate to say you're right. <laughs> but, you know, uh, so... I mean, I do think it needs to be criminalized. I'm not a huge fan of legalization. Uh, I think, you know, that especially the marijuana today is very, very potent and, de and definitely causes long-term brain changes for people in memory, learning, concentration. And I think there's about different, eight different brain areas that are really, you know, uh, impacted. I, I've got some great PowerPoint presentations and that's another day of time on that. So thank you for that question. Uh, anyone else have a, yeah, David? So it sounds to me like from your early description of your life that you were a high energy risk taking entrepreneurial businessman. <laughs> Recovery is then being able to be employed. If they can't 
aren't employed, they don't have money, they have increased stresses and all that time on their hands, and they are sure to relapse. And what's going to happen repeatedly, and they got a job, and all of a sudden they actually got recovered. Okay? So nowadays, all, everybody applies online, and all they do is hit the, the dummy box and they're done. There's no other chance they're going to get. So I'm really so, such a huge fan of the band the box, you know, and I watch a lot of people on the far left that probably are, you know, this is with the left, you know, which are a lot of us in this room, okay? We, we, we have a heart family, we have a bigger picture and what we really need to do in mind. But we, we have to do compromises along the way. And one of the things that I look at, like, with that, and I was actually talking to Mark Holden, the, the, uh, the, the attorney for the Koch brothers, that's very much, I was in an article in which saw people with him, about how they want, they think this whole thing the criminal justice system is a fiasco and maybe for different reasons than we do, but still the same well-intentioned place that we're ending up. And I said to Mark, Mark, you know, what we need to do is just have to go ahead and end it, you know, because that's how, when I came to Solana, I wasn't going to be able to get housing except for a very gracious man. I told him my history, and he didn't say, well, I'm a father and I'm out of the Seattle, okay? But he said, I'm going to give you a chance, right? And that's the way I finally got into an apartment when I moved to Wichita after I've been denied, I, I don't know how many. I talked to a guy that actually later I found out didn't know Father Gary. And uh, he, I, he said, you're going to pay the rent. I said, I promise I will. How are you going to do it? I'm on. I didn't have to fill out the app. That's what, so that's a huge policy thing there. Another huge policy deal is this. It's hot. It's people that get a traffic ticket and can't afford. Like I got two of them one time when I was just really throwing a ADD in. And you know, within a couple of months, and I mean like that was almost 290 bucks. And so I just thought, well, this is what happens. They can't pay the tickets, so they continue to drive and they get another ticket, right? Then that takes them to jail. Then that's a $500 fine. Then they can't get a license until they pay the whole thing off. So I got together with then Senator Bill Journey, not Judge Journey in Wichita, and five or six years ago we presented this very simple idea that why can't we make it to where these people can have a restricted license as long as they have proof of registration, pay on their fines, and you know, then guess what? We get our money. We get our money and then uh, you know they get a job and are tax productive citizens, you know. And I forget, I remember when I testified at a hearing at the people one time, and it was like I was just talking to a bunch of foreign, you know, I don't know, aliens, okay? Because the questions they asked were just crazy. Then one of them said, are these criminal justice people? Are these criminals? I said, no, actually, most of them are Kansas citizens, for one, and most of them don't, you know, are people that don't aren't in the criminal justice system. They're just top four. And I'll, I forget, I want to put him on front street because that's what he said. And Senator Les Donovan comes up to me afterwards and says, You know, Pete, most of those people that come to your place that are like that, you know, probably they're driving without their driver's license. And I said, Senator, with all due respect, what would you do if you had 300 miles to feed? And I've never spoken to him since. So, you know, that wasn't any good, but we weren't doing good on the hearing as it was. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't use my best political prowess there. But, uh, but you know, we're going to reintroduce that this year. We got the witch called Abel on board. And I just think it would be huge and powerful. Yes, ma'am. You're in favor of legal action, marijuana, and I do. No, I didn't say that. Oh, yeah, I know. Okay, okay. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I thought legal again. Okay. No, ma'am, I didn't. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I didn't say that. No, I'm glad you're checking me on that. <laughs> yes, yes, ma'am. Peter, it's not a question. I just, I want to thank you again. I've heard you three times, and I just want to tell you that you do a great job telling us about now, but in such a way that your face has changed and that we don't know that person you were talking about, that person that you were.
at all. But you know, about 75%, I quit smoking cigarettes on October 10th of 95. And after that, you know, I realized about six months later, oh my God, that was just all about making my money back to do it. That really wasn't that hard. And what did we, how many years to do it? So anyhow, when people are dependent on a substance, the fear of, of not having that substance is like telling them to jump out of the second floor window of my practice, and that's what I say. So that fear and that belief that they need that substance drives it. And so if you can just get them a little bit of help with those first steps and stages there, that is such a huge component. And today I was talking to, to Gerald, my friend Jerry Molesky here, Gerald, about just the advent of these medicated assisted treatments. So now Trexone, Vivitrol, same thing, and some of the other, even Suboxone, uh, which, you know, is also somewhat addictive. It is addictive without question. But I mean, how this process is, how serious this disease is, and how many of my patients, I'm watching actually get recovery and get a final chance at this brain disorder, this chemical, physiologically induced brain disorder that isn't anything about intelligence, it's about the brain changes that have occurred and their belief that they, you know, just the thought of them, the window of change is over that far, that long. <clears throat> and getting people there and past those fears is so, so huge. But thank you very much for your generous comments and, and sharing with us all. Uh, yes. As an elementary um, school teacher and a teacher of yoga on the St. Francis, are you familiar with St. Francis West? Yeah. Um, I do yoga. Yes, yeah. out there, and I teach elementary special education. So I kind of feel like I see some faces at a very young age. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and That's just 
just taken their masters to Washington. And oh my gosh, she's teaching herself like crazy. I'm like, man, this is great. She's never done this. She just worked for me as a secretary for a couple of years. But, you know, they're really getting all of this, you know, this connectivity and sense of belonging and all of that kind of stuff. It's just really powerful, powerful stuff. Um, any, anybody else? Um, yes, Kathy. That's the first thing I give to people is my story. But, you know, actually, so understanding that it's not what's wrong with them, it's what happened to them, and, and show them that in conversation. And that's where everything starts from. But Kathy's right, you know, it's always been viewed as a moral failing. And, you know, I have a thing Dr. Volkow says, uh, and I would love her, Dr. Nora Volkow, uh, Volkow the uh, director of the National Institutes of Drug Abuse. She said, just say no is magical thinking. <laughs> And, uh, you know, when you have a, a disrupt of the critical brain structures and drugs are two to ten times more powerful than your other most best rewards you've ever had, I mean, it's like an 80-year-old, yeah, it's like an 80-year-old lady told me a couple of years ago, I had one of the saddest days, um, and, I, and I felt extremely honored, but it, it was a horrible day. My, uh, one of my best friends in Wichita, uh, who is highly successful, him and his wife, but four of their kids, out of their six kids, have addiction issues, but they lost their 30-year-old daughter to opiate addiction. So many we're losing today. So I, that Tom just asked me to come speak at the funeral. He didn't want to hear all these people that were on drugs get up and blah, blah, blah. And I got up and just got to do the same thing, you guys. I got to tell about this lady's life and correlate it straight with the disease of addiction and the memorial for that disease, just like we would have any other disease. And, and I found out, and I'm not, I'm just, grateful, you know, I had the opportunity, but the 80-year-old lady came up to me after and she said, young man, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> she said, that was just powerful. She said, you know what stuck out to me? If it was twice as good as the best experience I ever had, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I thought that, that that really made me feel good because she, she really got that. Um, but um, you know, that's, that's really just some of the things that really getting this message out about addiction as a disease. And, you know, we really are creating people as prisoners, not patients. You know, we really are. Because people don't understand that we actually have, again, physiologically, chemically, and, uh, chemically induced brain disorder. And that we can show pictures. I mean, thank God, you know, that there's homeostasis, and we really, our body wants to get back, our brain wants to go back to its normal state. And we know that primarily, in most cases, it does where people restore normal functioning and whatnot. But there's so many people, Kathy and I and others, you know, that have had this happen to us in our lives, and, and those others that have spoken about it, and then we can get a life back. But the problem is, is one of the major problems is this too, you know. We both have this really great, we, people in recovery have this really great intrinsic feeling about that, and having all this power of just changing your life and having a whole new view and perspective of the world. But the bottom line is, is, is that when people use drugs and they have these huge imprints of dopamine that come in there, the brain quits producing dopamine, so when they quit doing it, they feel 
flat and lifeless, depressed. They've given up every friend that they have. They're living in isolation, and nothing, including spending time with their children, is any fun. Can you imagine that? Okay? So we have to work intensively, extensively enough with them to help them stay clean and start doing positive activities and positive relationships that start reinforcing and building dopamine back up where it naturally, I got a kid, and once I got him, nobody else was getting me, but he was, he came in, and he'd been using methamphetamine since he was 14 years old. He had five weeks of recovery, and Jennifer, my counselor, said, well, Pete, I don't know, I think he can relate with you, or, you know, can you take me today? That's what she said, she had a double book, and I said, okay, so he came in and told me that, I'm like, okay, he's mine now. Okay, because I showed him a video, right? I showed him a video. I said, he said, nobody's ever told me this. And, and this kid doesn't have probably but a sixth grade, seventh, you know, maybe a seventh or eighth grade education, right? Has now got about three months of recovery. He's holding down a job, and he's doing great. Now I'm getting him to go to outside support meetings. And now we're starting the social anxiety group, which I'm really excited about. And, and all of a sudden, I've got all these patients that are all, they all have social anxiety. Now, I didn't have that, but I mean, so many people, they call it, as you can tell, but so many people have this thing they call psychic recruit. When they're young, they, they recruit because of social anxiety. And so what happens is when they do the lubricant, you know, drugs and alcohol, all of a sudden they feel natural, they're accepted, they get a sense of belonging. Jimmy had never ever talked to anybody went to the party and everybody said, wow, I see Jimmy going off last night. Jimmy's all yucky and that's who I am. And that's who he becomes, not who he is. So he never learns to deal, and that's one of the things with marijuana, that marijuana is an unbelievable social agent for young people. And that, by the way, is the most important thing to them is their friend. So they smoke, they get high, and all of a sudden they're immediately accepted. They get all the, you know, all that feelings and all that. And so what happens is, is they start to use this to cope with all their emotions, rejection, disappointment, anger, everything, and they never learn, <clears throat> which when my counselor in Salina, Kansas, when I got out of prison for me, she thought I had arrested development, and I was offended, but I, I can't remember the conversation. <laughs> but I try not to be outside of the big point, okay, she maybe has a point, and I don't know, but I told her, well, what do you mean? You know, I'm 45 years old, I just did it. Presentation to the community, to uh, Andy invited me over to do a presentation at Community Corrections on how to get in touch with that rest of you. And now you're telling me I have a rest of development. And she was right. Okay? I never learned how to deal with commitment, emotions, a lot of things other than in my life. And I did start learning some of that, but I also see the impulsivity and other things that we see that go along with this drug using behavior. And if you guys see the slides, and now the new research on marijuana shows that it promotes, that cannabinoids promote cell growth and development. So we're seeing in young children and adolescents, and I've got a chart that shows where they, they started using before 14, their chances of any becoming dependent are almost four times higher than if they started using at 17 or 18. Just the difference between the brain development. So, I mean, it's just, you know, it's just, and so legal, legalizing this stuff, you know, I just can't. I, you know what I do? I can't do it. It's it just, what I want, I can't do it. Oh, my God, no. I would be freaked out, you know? She told me this is really a great one. One day, she hates it. She's not a great to tell. Uh, one night, when I just started my new practice, and she was in the back seat when she was nine. She was sweet and nice. She's 13 now, okay? <laughs> <laughs> You guys see it. Uh, so anyhow, she says, Dad, you know, I've been thinking a lot about using, you know, I've thought a lot about drugs, and I've decided that I'm not going to use drugs. And I said, well, sweetie, that's a really good choice. How did you come up with that? She said, well, Dad, I started eating sugar, and now I can't quit eating it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it really is like that. And the other thing that's really crazy with all this, you guys, is that um, the one thing that's really um, 
crazy with all this is, is that we have this thing in our brain called nucleus accumbens, and that determines the quality of our experience, right? And the nucleus accumbens are directly uh, tied to the basalt ganglion. It's about our memories. So it goes in, it, it records it, and like, otherwise we just be a walking contradiction. You know, I want carrot cake and I want to turn to right? And, you know, whatever it was, we wouldn't know whether we were going to have chicken or beef or whatever. And it records all these things in the memory, and in the nanosecond, it goes there. Okay? Well, think about these drug memories that go there, and they're two to ten times greater, and they've done this thing where they call, they have memory bumps in the dendrites, and they can go back and show where a woman had a child, and the oxytocin that was released from that, and the imprints when people use drugs the first time are that big or bigger. And these memories are huge, and all that we can do to overcome them is put them more in the longer term, you know, memory where we start to control them. So here's the deal. Like, I can do opiates and just get sick, and I'm like, who would ever do that? I've done heroin on several occasions because it's mixed with cocaine, and I was addicted to coke, so I would do whatever to get the coke, right? Crazy. But anyhow, I never did, thank God, I ever get addicted to that. So different people with different drugs, like some people try marijuana, hate it, and will never do it again. Other people try alcohol, and my God, it's like Katie bought the door. So our brain, we all have this individual, you know, our brain chemistry and to who we are. It's all made, you know, it's going to be any more unique and individual to who we are, gene-wise and otherwise. And by the way, gene-wise, if your parent or family members, immediate family members or parents, you know, have alcohol dependence, your, your chance of developing that are fourfold. And the way we get that is frequency and amount. A lot of people use drugs to some extent, say marijuana, but say, you know, I tell my kids all the time, look, if you can smoke pot once a month, I would give them no big deal, you know? Or I tell them adult that, rather, you know what I mean? But they like it, and pretty soon they're doing it once a week, and pretty soon they're doing it two or three times a week because that starts to drive their behavior. But there's a big thing to it, it depends on the drug and the host, the person. So there's, there's, the complexity of this disease is, is just untold. So actually to kind of get to some, you know, back, back to the prison element of it, there's so much about this disease that drives our prison system. It drives criminal behaviors. I mean, we, we know it's at least half of the people that are in prison. So if we really can start getting a hold of that, you know, and start educating people about it, so individually each one of you people have great opportunity to educate people. And some years ago, Faces and Voices of Recovery said that 65% of Americans had someone close to them or uh, in their family or close to them that had a drug or alcohol problem. Well, that was in 2006 or seven. Today, I think it's way over that because listen to this. In 2013, Dr. Nora Volkow said that there were 213 million opiate prescriptions issued in the United States of America in that year, which was enough to keep every adult medicated for 30 days straight. I did a, a presentation to the Chamber of Commerce last year, I put it up, it's 259 million. So this is an epidemic. And if you guys see the patients that I see, and many of us have loved ones, family members, or know someone that has a prescription pain pill problem. And this stuff is devastating our country. It is truly an epidemic. So, um, anyone else have any questions or comments? Yes, anyone? Uh, I just have an observation. Um, I'm one of the newer reaching out from the volunteers. That's fine. But it's, what it's, it's been an eye opener. And one of the things I think all of us would agree that we're learning about is the multi-generational chaos and drug abuse and alcohol abuse and physical abuse that people who are in our prison systems are coming from. Uh, they don't know what normal relationships are like at all because it is multi-generational. Some of them have several generations of their families in prison as well. But when you're a young person coming up in that environment, and all you know is this abuse of substance life. Um, it is 
not a contender should. And then there's the multi generational foster care, because we step in and try to help by taking kids out of that environment. And now people are in prison whose kids are in foster care. Um, my question to you almost is how do we as a general public keep our, make some impact way back at the time that they're living in these environments that then induce them to follow in their you know, footsteps? Is there you know, I'm just, I'm just, I feel like we have to keep going further and further back to try to address this. It steps beyond what you're doing because I really love what you're doing, but I just wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Well, it, it definitely is everything that, that you said it is. It's the normalization of it, and that's how, you know, I, I want to say before I go to there, you know, people ask me about drugs, and I say, you know, it was a horrible experiment by our generation gone terribly wrong that 50 years later has devastated families, communities, and our society. It, it really has. Now, to speak to that, I think, you know, I watch kids, some kids have marvelous resiliency. So anything that we can do to encourage them, again, just positive reinforcement, trying to get the family in, you know, and, and really connecting with them on any level, and you know, working on, you know, one of the things that I left out that I need to bring up, and this directly relates to what you're talking about, and that is this insaneness that we in Kansas are being denied five to eight hundred million dollars that we all pay taxes on for Medicaid expansion because this gives these people health care. You know, I also should say I have a child and family play therapist at my practice, and we see these little adoption issues and drug issues and all issues. And all of this, and these people, so many of these people, you know, they don't have health insurance. And that's where we really got, I mean, that's one place that we can really start. And, you know, that, that would be the number one thing. And anybody in the room that can do anything to talk to your representatives, your state representatives, last couple years ago, and I don't mean to take away from this, contributes to it greatly. Uh, there was a group of us that met in Wichita, we, in Wichita around the state. And, and it was called the, the death box. The death box was what they called it for the 330 people in Kansas that would die out a few years ago from not having Medicaid that they should have otherwise had. <clears throat> and so what that would have created was 5,000 jobs and 180,000 people being insured. So I got together, I was part of the group, and I love seeing Kelly, who is a, he calls himself a conservative Texas Republican that's the CEO of the new regional medical center. And he, had, he headed up our group, the Kansas Hospital Association, to try to get to the, you know, he says, you guys, you got to, you know, he's telling the people that I was with that were very, very far left, you guys got to go holler, shouting at people and start talking to them. But and so anyhow, he formed a group that we went down to Topeka and testified, and I just was in uh, written testimony because there was, I mean, it was a chamber of commerce, it was Kansas Hospital Association, they had 300 people in the in the, in the capital that day, and it was an uplifting day. The next day, there was somebody for prosperity, you know who that is, and somebody else came in, they were out of state, people that came in and testified against Obamacare, that's all they called it, that's all they needed to say, and the next day, we were all devastated. They decided, they made the decision that the house, the chair of the house, made the decision that they were not going to even have a hearing on it. So I couldn't do it last year, they involved, but they haven't gone again this year. But this is really huge. It's breaking Kansas hospitals and you know rural hospitals. And it's poor people. And you know, we even got to start paying for this stuff up front. It's either paying now or paying later. So I, I think you guys just try that without me. One one last question. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I bring family members in more times than not. I mean, I, I definitely do that. And it's a huge and powerful component. And one of the things that this lady brought up so eloquently in these folks, they don't know a boundary from Adam. I mean, there's not even any recognition of what that word is or means. You know what I mean? There's not. And, and you know, boundaries are the number one things that we 
all have to deal with every day in our life that make us healthy or not, right? And so, yes, ma'am, you have a thought. I just wonder, in addition to the expansion of Medicaid, are there other legislative agendas, public policy, that we ought to be talking with the candidates or our legislators about? What's on the top of the list? Well, to me, that one's number one. And then, <laughs> and then the next one is the garbage office is saying, from my perspective, I'm working with people that are poor, impoverished, and they can't give it, they can't make it work, right? And, and if we just simply did that, they could go to work. We've got over 100,000 people in Kansas that fall into this. It's crazy. It's short sighted, yes. I just want to say with regard to licensing, I know a lot of people personally who lost their license who are addicts and it has led to them being an addict and then they couldn't go to work or they couldn't, you know. I have a daughter personally who was in facilities, I adopted her and she got out and she couldn't get medical assistance. So therefore, where is she? She's on the streets today. There you go. There's a story right there. There's a story right there. That's what we're looking at. And it just doesn't make any sense. So you know, folks, here's the other thing. People just have a lot of really simple solutions to really complex problems. We've heard that a lot lately. <laughs> Without going there. But anyhow, those generally don't work so well, you know. And and this is this is the thing. If we can start addressing some of this from the core, from the children, you know, and the families and providing health care and getting people in. I mean, it's just so empowering and so powerful if we can do that. Um, I think I, I, was gonna, I just had one thing I was going to tell you guys about being in prison and just the, the last thing maybe about that, that, you know, the most difficult thing in prison for me, okay, one thing was that you never had any alone time. I, I remember when I first got my apartment in Salina after Neil and Pam uh, put me up for about three months when I first got out of us of arts. Um, God, that just having my own, you know, having being by myself alone. Wow, it felt great. Today, when people say, I'm like, oh, no, I'm good, I'm all home alone. <laughs> no, it, it feels great. So that's one of the things that people don't realize that people in prison, you never have any solitude. And you think about how valuable that is to all of us. Okay? The other thing from a mental perspective that really was the most difficult thing I think I had to deal with was about five years into my prison sentence, knowing that I had made the changes that incarceration was intended to make, and I still had 25 years to do in prison. Think about how many people are in prison today, like I was, with that same situation. So, I want to thank you all for all your care and concern about this issue and your work in restoring people's lives and changing the criminal justice system.